Hello and welcome. COVID-19 is an unprecedented occurrence for the world, the wider economy and our Jamaat. It's unprecedented because it has obstructed many of the vital organs of a functioning commercial economy, personal interaction, trade, travel. The objective of this short webinar is to try and make sense of the most important economic implications on the wider global economy. We'll structure the presentation in discussing the economy as a whole, but also some of the emerging themes which impact all sectors, such as globalization, digitization, and skills. These are not just mere buzzwords, but are actual themes which will impact our lives. It's also important to put a disclaimer here. These views in no way can be considered certain. We cannot look through a crystal ball and project what will happen in the future. But what we aim to do is to summarize what we believe to be the most cogent arguments available to us by the leading economic thinkers of our time. We also have put in place a way for you to provide feedback, either in the comments section below or on an extended survey. We'll also make available a slide pack, which we hope will help you rethink some of what has been discussed today. I'll also take the opportunity to introduce the other two speakers in the webinar. First is Karim Jetta, board member for EPB, and Brahim Herji, who is a leading thinker in edtech and digitization. We now start with what are the implications for the wider economy? The Chancellor recently said that the UK is heading towards what he thinks is the fastest and deepest recession for over a century. UK GDP, gross domestic product, is expected to fall around 15% for 2020, similarly to global GDP. We are now entering what's being termed as the 90% economy, an economy which is functioning at 10% of its usual growth levels. And this is triggered by declines in the number of factors. Um, the first is, of course, household consumption, the amount that households have money to spend and consume. And this is expected to fall by 30% this year. Company sales is expected to fall by 45%, business investment by 50%. Of course, some sectors are more affected than others. Tourism is a notable example. Tourism in Europe has fallen from 5 million people to 50,000 last month. and No doubt this month is even worse. Now, the reasons for these declines are hinged in supply and demand. On the demand side, which is how we can think of our demand for goods and services, or how much we consume, has been affected by, of course, social distance regulations, um, and of course, job uncertainty as well. This leads to lower footfall in the social uh, distancing regulations. And when it comes to job uncertainty, this leads to a greater propensity to save rather than spend. On the supply side, which is how much is being produced, many workplaces have closed, like construction sites. And there have also been many disruptions to the supply chain, which means goods take much longer time to come to us. However, we must also remember that green shoots are emerging and there are signs of recovery. Now, it's uncertain what the trajectory of this recovery looks like. It could be like a V-shape, which is short and fast, or it could be a U-shape where the trough is a little bit deeper and the recovery out will take a bit longer, or even an L-shaped where the recovery is expected to be quite extended and quite slow. What we do think is that there will be an expectation for positive GDP next year in 2021 and 2022, although this positive growth in the economy is likely to be incremental and not in the same level as before. I think it's also useful to look at the example of China, which is an example of a country that has come out of COVID. Industrial production is nearly at 100% of its pre-COVID levels, very interestingly. But of course, services, uh, which is the predominant economic factor for the UK, is at 70% of pre-COVID-19 levels. And of course, export Exports are continuing to fall as well, although there is a substitution effect as China gains market share in other um, types of uh, economic products and with other countries. So moving now into thinking about the recovery, why is a recovery expected? What are the key factors behind it? The first thing to think about is financial conditions. And the government has made a concerted effort to increase 
or at least one could say mitigate the risks of tightening financial conditions. This is really about the amount of money that banks can lend to other businesses to, or other individuals and create money supply in the economy. The UK has committed around 2.5% of its GDP or £55 billion pounds, um, for guaranteed loans for banks to provide businesses. This is even more than the great financial crisis in 2008. This, of course, creates not only um, a buffer in terms of budget for businesses, but it also creates business confidence, which will help the recovery. The second aspect is in household income. And if you were to think about what's the biggest driver of how much money you have in your pocket, it's your employment. Now, unemployment is expected to double to 8% this year, but this number could have been far higher if the government didn't put in place a furlough of paying 80% of, of salaries. And the good news is this has been extended to October, even if it's going to be shouldered a bit more by, by businesses. Again, if this hadn't, take, hadn't taken place, the recovery would have been uh, much more uh, extended and much likely to happen further down the line. And finally, business income, the amount of money that companies have um, to, to continue to produce. There has been a 1200, sorry, a 12 billion pound budget aid and also various loan guarantees and wage subsidies, which have offset declines in some business income. But many businesses are expected to go bust and there are real uh, issues at play. On time payment, for example, for commercial ten tenants have had decreased by 30 percent um, in, in the first quarter and various banks are reporting real hikes and non-performing loans and bankruptcies. What are the risks that we need to think about when we project on where the economy could go next year? Of course, the most uh, notable one would be the risk of a second wave. If a second wave does come, it would extend the time w in which the recovery would, uh, would, would begin. The second would be the availability of a vaccine. And I think it's important here to distinguish between pre-testing of a vaccine and a full widespread implementation of a vaccine which actually is happening and, ha and, 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 uh, and, and which we can actually participate in. This is expected to come into place by the middle of next year, of course, difficult to say. And any announcement on a vaccine will disturb the markets, either in a positive way or in a negative way. It's also worth thinking about taxes and inflation. Whenever a government tries to borrow, it can borrow from the markets um, through uh, bonds or it can raise taxes. And it's likely that taxes will be raised in this particular case, but there is a strong argument that a lot of corporates, particularly the corporates who have done quite well, such as technology companies, um, will shoulder that burden, for example, through a windfall tax. In terms of inflation, this is a little bit more difficult to forecast. and forecasts have been quite mixed. On the one hand, you do have low rates, uh, which usually is a trigger for more borrowing, more consumption, and therefore more inflation. But of course, we are in a recession, or we will be officially in a, in a recession, and it's unlikely that business growth will increase to such an extent that inflation becomes an issue. What does this mean for the Jamaat? Well, it's hard to say, but of course, for this year in particular, we need to be prudent. Um, both in terms of how we save and also ensuring our job security. Moving ahead, we need to have positive expectation of there being a recovery, but make sure we are on top of any sort of services um, or initiatives that the government is going to provide us. Now, COVID-19 will, of course, have implications on individual sectors and the impact on each individual sector is beyond the scope of this webinar. But what we've tried to do is identify three of the most important themes which we think will cut across all the sectors. This is digitization, globalization, and future skills. I'll now hand over to Karim, who will talk a little bit about globalization. Thank you, Farzan, for that helpful summary of the main economic implications. Let's now dive into the first of our themes, which is globalization. It's a word we hear banded around a lot, but what does it actually mean? At its essence, globalization is about the spread of goods, services, technology, and information across national borders. And that's all great. We've seen a lot of benefits, you know, particularly, you know, one can get the latest iPhone, but it's less so when a virus can spread from China across the world in just a few short months. And so we're starting to see a bit of a backlash now against globalization that could lead to substantial changes in the economy. And in particular, we'd highlight travel, 
trade and supply chains as areas that we think are going to be impacted. So maybe we'll start with travel because I think that's the most visible effect of where we can all see uh, this backlash. And I think travel is being hit potentially by three areas, regulation, demand and supply factors. So firstly on regulation, countries are establishing more stringent border controls now to contain the spread of the virus. On the demand side, consumers may be less willing to travel until the fear factor of catching COVID-19 subsides. Now this may be until there is a successful treatment or a vaccine or just general consumer confidence recovers and maybe it's something we learn to live with. And on the supply side, I think we're likely to see a reduced choice of flights as airlines struggle to stay afloat with reduced demand. In spite of these challenges, there are though going to be opportunities. If you're a business that's currently dependent on international travel, both inbound and outbound, I think it's likely that this may be subdued for some time. So perhaps you could think about repositioning yourself for more the domestic market, because I think tourism domestically is still likely to be quicker to recover. That being said, the desire for international travel is likely to remain. And I think one solution that governments are proposing is a concept of air bridges. And this is essentially travel between low risk countries. So, you know, Brits may no longer be able to travel freely back and forth between, say, China and the UK, but we may see increased opportunities in friendly countries. The next area is trade. And I think for much of the 90s and the noughties, free trade was the name of the game. But in recent years, we've seen more and more countries start to adopt a protectionist stance. This was a really key issue in the UK, obviously, with Brexit. And it's also been a key issue really in the US. And they've been examining and re-examining a lot of their historic trading relationships. And any of you who've listened to Donald Trump in the last few years will know what I'm talking about. So we might see tariffs being hiked in the future, and we might even see outright bans on foreign investment from certain countries that are deemed unfriendly. Um, but we will still, again, see opportunities. I think any sector that's deemed important to national security is likely to see growth opportunities. This might be in agriculture, medical equipment, pharmaceuticals, just to name a few. Then perhaps finally, if we just touch briefly on supply chains. Now, this pandemic resulted in tremendous uncertainty on the availability of inputs as well as goods. This was all very obvious to us. Anyone who visited a supermarket, certain goods became very difficult to source for a period of time. I think going forwards, businesses are going to have to think very carefully about the number and the location of their suppliers. They might even wish to stockpile greater inventory levels in order to mitigate the impact of any business disruption. Before I hand over, though, I just want to leave you with a quick example of a company that was able to reposition itself for the new normal. And this is the example of a company called BA Transfers. It's an airport transfer taxi service and its hub is Heathrow. Now, they observed that passenger traffic at Heathrow absolutely collapsed, as it did you know, across the country and, and arguably internationally. And it was estimated to be down 97 percent in terms of passenger traffic you know, in just six weeks after the outbreak of COVID-19. Now, their challenge was how to make the most of their fleet of taxis, given the uncertain length of the business disruption. Now, they quickly identified that there was a huge demand for online delivery services from their existing customer base and national supermarkets just couldn't keep up with the demand. Meanwhile, they had a big fleet of drivers and cars. And so they thought, well, why don't we launch our own grocery delivery service? And they quickly did, one called 2local.co.uk. This isn't meant to be a plug for BA transfers, but it's just an example of a company that by showing agility, they've turned the crisis into an opportunity. I'll now hand over to Rahim to discuss how COVID-19 has impacted digitization. Thank you, Karim. Before we uh, dig into uh, digitalization and the themes within it, I'd like to cover uh, what we actually mean by digitization or digitalization. In uh, technical terms, this is the transfer of data from a traditional form to being used within a digital context. Well, what does that mean um, in simple terms for you and me? How I like to look at it is uh, thinking about anything that you can do on your mobile phone, um, or a laptop or a digital device. So music has moved uh, to Spotify and you can read um, your news or a book on a digital device. Um, you can now have online banking on your phone and we have digital only banks like Monzo. Retail has moved to places like uh, Amazon and eBay and you can even have an appointment with your doctor online. 
But what does that mean in a post-COVID context, especially in the context of how we buy? Technology was moving at pace before COVID-19 and COVID-19 has been like a real catalyst that has pushed us forward three to five years in three to five months. What that means is that consumer behavior has shifted past where we have existed for the last two to three years. So how we used to consume technology or use technology in the last two to three years has shifted very quickly in the last two to three months. So everything has moved um, fast uh, on, the, uh, on the adoption curve. So if we think of uh, online supermarket delivery, I'm sure many of you experienced that all the delivery slots um, were gone, were oversubscribed um, over the last couple of months. And Ocado saw 40% year-on-year -year growth over the previous quarter. So if you are a consumer, you'll be consuming more online. And if you're a retailer, your shift will have to focus on being on selling online more so than you ever did before. We call that omni-channel and being, being able to sell in multiple channels. And that takes us on to the next point, which is about how we consume um, uh, media. Um, especially during lockdown, it is absolutely clear to see that we watch what we want, what we want to watch and where, we, where and when we want to watch it. So unless it is a live one time only broadcast like the uh, president's address or Boris talking to the nation, we no longer consume as a collective or at the same time. And that will mean lots more bespoke and targeted advertising following you and me around the internet, whether you're on Instagram, Google, or some of you are on TikTok. Uh, many of us didn't use Zoom regularly or hadn't even heard of it, but it has become the de facto choice for family reunions, uh, for Pilates classes, um, or quiz nights. Zoom's rise to 300 million participants is six times faster than that of Instagram's um, or the online game uh, Fortnite. Zoom has become the poster child of the COVID catalyst that I talked about a little bit earlier. So the opportunity for the Jamaat in this space is to leverage these very wide global networks, especially for knowledge and for work across channels like WhatsApp, global work networks like, uh, like Upwork, to supplement income or supplement supply of temporary labor from around the world. Which brings us on to uh, work. I, I don't think uh, the workplace will ever be the uh, same again. Many companies um, that haven't had to furlough their staff um, over lockdown have uh, shifted to full remote working um, and using tools like Slack, um, Microsoft Teams, Google Meet, Zoom and other productivity tools uh, to keep us all on, on the same page. Um, and some companies will stay like this on a virtual remote basis going forward. Um, technology companies especially. So Twitter have said that they're going to uh, go fully remote. Facebook have said that they'll eventually move to 50% remote. Um, but many will sit within um, a bracket of new flexibility. So that's uh, having some time at work and some time uh, working from home. All depends on the focus of the company. So what is the challenge that we need to be ready for? If you have a business that depends on footfall, for example, dry cleaning or uh, coffee shops, the numbers won't be as they were previously. And if you're an employee, it's going to be hugely important that you have the right setup um, at, at home, as well as the uh, flexibility to cater for this new uh, working world. And lastly, on digitization, I want to touch on education. Over the last three months, those of us that are parents have had to very quickly become educators. And there was uh, a large scale usage of new educational platforms like uh, Google Classroom and Microsoft Teams. We all think that schools and universities will return at least by September, but uh, Cambridge University announced that it is uh, unsafe for them to return to a normal setting uh, and we'll, re we'll move to a uh, remote model for the whole of the forthcoming academic year to 2021. And that's indicative of a new model of education as we go forward. There will be a blend of remote learning, self-study and where possible in-class activity. 
What does that mean for us? It means that we have to be flexible in the way that we learn, but it also gives us uh, more, of a more of an opportunity to be in control of what we learn, which takes us on to the next area of future skills. So firstly, before we talk about these skills, um, what do we actually mean by uh, future skills? Future skills are the broad set of skills that would be hugely important to um, employers and for employability in the future. And that covers everything from soft skills like critical thinking, like decision making, to some harder technology skills like programming. And so if we were moving to a technology-centric society, what are the areas um, that we need to focus on, both as parents and as adults? And I want to touch on two specific areas, STEM and data science. That doesn't mean that the arts are bad careers to go down, um, but these are areas that have proven and consider are being considered as really important. So if we take... Um, science and technology from STEM, for example. We have seen over the last three months how important both of these industries um, have been in supporting the national economy of this country, and indeed uh, the world. Whether it was the medical professionals on the front line or research to find the next vaccine, or whether it was the technology infrastructure to keep our economy running, these areas will continue to be critical for the economy. In fact, 80% of industries will require a deep understanding of STEM subjects, no matter the vertical that you're in. Science and technology will be critical in artificial intelligence, which will drive everything from healthcare to retail. But not everyone wants to go into a STEM-led career, in which case the advice is to try and maintain STEM options for as long as possible, whether that's an option at school or whether that's at university or whether you can find something vocational to do. Finally, I'd like to touch on data science. I can't stress enough how important data will be over the coming 5, 10 or 20 years. So there are two main reasons for this. Firstly, uh, because it helps business leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs make decisions on statistical numbers and trends. But secondly, with our whole world completely digitized, connected with device upon device upon device, data is being produced in mass abundance every time you interact with anything. So it is absolutely important for healthcare as we personalize medicine, in retail as we move towards the heart of the consumer, and across a whole number of industries as they become even more digitized. But how can you skill up to stay ahead in, in data science if you haven't a clue about data science. Um, I'd say try and pick one of the current languages um, that can help in interrogating data. So my rec recommendation for this would be to go on a Python course or an SQL course. Um, but if that's beyond you um, and it's beyond many of us, um, I would look to try something you know, in, in the software field that allows you to visualize data. So things like Periscope or Tableau, uh, which will show you trends in, a, in, a, in, in software. So many of these courses are available online at companies like uh, General Assembly um, and Udemy. And I would urge you to try and at least attempt one of them to get a better understanding of this space. Um, and so now I'll pass you back on to Farzeen, who will uh, wrap up. Thank you, Rahim. This marks now the end of the webinar for COVID-19. We hope that it has been useful for you in trying to disentangle some of the key economic themes that everyone is talking about. To reiterate, when we think about the implications of the global economy, we should be cautious about the recession that will happen this year, but we should also be optimistic about the green shoots thereafter. When we think about globalization, there are, of course, real challenges on international trade, but certainly some opportunities from the reorientation to the domestic economy. When we think about digitization, we should be excited about the accelerated adoption of many di di digital channels. And finally, when we think about future skills, we should absolutely make sure that we align ourselves or at least prepare ourselves and our kids to 
subjects which are more scientific or technological in nature. I want to use this opportunity also to please ask for your feedback, either via the comments below or on a survey. But in any case, thank you once again for joining us.